Hi, everyone, and welcome to another exciting episode of Sensation Chats. I'm Francesca, your host, and today we have a very special guest with us, Kate Aitken. Kate is making big waves in the tech world, especially at Google, where she is the AI strategy lead for the CIO. So she's here today to share an incredible story about climbing the career ladder in banking and in tech and how she balances her high-flying career with personal life. So we are super, super excited to have her on the show today. Welcome, Kate, and we are so glad you could join us today. I'm delighted to be here and delighted to catch up with you, Fra. It's been years since we worked together in banking, and I'm excited to dig back up some of the stories and lessons from when we worked together and first met. Great. So let's start from banking then. Let's start from the beginning. Uh, could you could you please um, tell us about your early days in banking? What it was like for you as a young woman in that world? Uh, like what were some of the challenges you faced? Or, you know, how, how did you overcome them? Yeah, I, uh, I'll start by saying I, my parents both worked in finance. I think they were both surprised I wanted to go into finance. I honestly went into finance because uh, math and finance and the, just the world of business kind of terrified me. And I know that a lot of people get the advice, you know, follow your passions, do what you love, uh, do what you're good at. And I figured I might as well, with nothing to lose, you know, graduate, get the best job I can in the toughest field I can and learn as much as I can. And so I'm not sure I ever fully bought into the idea that I was going to be in banking forever, but I really thought of Wall Street and specifically the, the two years as an analyst, um, which is a very standard program. Um, I thought of it as like financial boot camp, and I thought I'm going to learn to be comfortable with Excel and modeling and financial statements and being interrogated at the drop of a hat as to whether or not a number is right and justifying uh, my work at the, at the drop of a hat. And honestly, that is exactly what happened. I got a really great, you know, boot camp in things that I wasn't, skills that I wasn't confident in before. Um, and I know we'll talk about this more, but, you know, that's something that I often advise people now, especially in your 20s. It's a time to explore. And so many people only do things that they are really comfortable with because they're so scared to fail. Your 20s are for failing. Like if you're not failing at half the things you're trying, you're not learning what you like and don't like and what you're good at and you're not good at. Um, and you know, real life comes later, right? You get married, you have kids, you have a mortgage. You know, it's a little scarier to fail uh, at a certain point in life. And, you know, I was very lucky. I, I, you know, graduated without debt from college. I was living in an expensive city in New York where I'm from but I was able to get a good paying job. And I thought worst case, I totally flame out. And then, you know, maybe I move home for a couple months and find a new job. I was very lucky, but I think a lot of people put pressure on themselves early in their careers that they have to be a rock star from day one. I was never the best person in my investment banking class. And it didn't matter, I was learning a ton and I still use all those skill sets today. Um, moving into tech, I'm not necessarily like the techiest person. I'm definitely not a, a technical a person in a technical <laughs> role. I'm not a software engineer, um, but I lean on a lot of the business judgment and business analytics that I learned in banking. Um, and it's really useful in different contexts. So I think also jumping around and using your skill sets in different areas and rounding out your skill set is really important too. That's great. And thank you. <sighs> I really believe this. I mean, you've made some impressive strides in your career. And, um, but could you talk a little bit about a mindset that have helped you own your career part? You already mentioned part of it now, but is there any advice that you would give to someone in their early 20s? I think you just said it, own your career, right? And Oftentimes we don't really understand what that means. To me, it means asking for what you want. So for example, um, you know, my father is British. I have dual citizenship with the US and UK. And I was very excited about the prospect. We were working for a British bank. I was excited about going to London and covering British clients on the ground in London. And um, I was in the financial institutions group my first two years at Barclays and putting your hands up and saying, this is something I want. That was how I got to cover the British clients. 
you know, there was a time when we were doing a fairness opinion for a major stock exchange client, putting my hand up and saying, send me over. I'll go. I'll meet the clients. I'll, I'll pull the all-nighters. You, you kind of need to raise your hand for the things that you want because nobody's going to kind of be sitting there thinking, gosh, would Kate like to do this? Or if they are, you know, that's just when the stars align and the stars don't always align. Sometimes you have to align the stars for yourself. So I, I just found that it was more, much more um, attainable to get what I wanted and go where I wanted if I was very clear with the people around me about what that looked like and where I wanted to go and what help I needed from them. Um, so when I got my third year analyst offer, I said, I will accept if you send me to London. They were very amenable to that. But, but I think a lot of people um, don't, don't necessarily open their mouth, put up their hand and don't want to rock the boat especially if it's something competitive. I mean, I, I don't know that there were too many people who were volunteering to go to London, but sometimes it's putting your hand up and saying, I want a promotion. I think I'm ready. Maybe nobody's actually thought of you as ready for the promotion. Maybe it's actually a pretty narrow window uh, for getting people promoted. But if, if people don't think of you and, and know you want to toss your hat in the ring, it's not going to happen. And, and I think that's only become more clear, you know, moving through not only banking, but consulting and tech the more senior you get, the more you realize that it does take a village. You need a, a whole network of sponsors and mentors and people who should be thinking about your career. It's almost their job to think about their about your career because part of an executive's job or, or a senior leader's job is to think about the talent that they're building. Um, and somebody actually, when I was in consulting at McKinsey, told me that. They said, don't feel awkward about asking people, uh, senior people or sponsors for for favors and for you know, help with your career, that's literally part of their job is to develop talent. Um, and I think that's true across across companies, uh, certainly all the big, you know, international companies that we're talking about um, and have experience with. At a certain point, that is your job is to nurture talent. And so in some ways, you're making an executive's job easier by saying, hi, this is where I want to go in my career. I want to stay here. I want to build, you know, my professional life. Um, here are the skill sets I bring. Here are the skills I think you could use. Uh, here's the kind of work I want to do. It, it just makes it easier. It takes the guesswork out of it for them. And I can, you know, fully testimony this because we have been colleagues. Um, so I, you know, I can say that you were super direct and, and that was also, I mean, apart from your smartness and your, you know, you're very good at what you're doing, but I think, the fact that you're very clear with your line manager or, you know, which are your goals, which are your aspirations and the fact that you're eager to learn, I think it's super important and you're a living testimony of this. And I can say, yes, I remember you were doing this. So, uh, well done. Um, well, can but, I tell a story uh, from when we were together in London that kind of gets to this? So I'm going to embarrass you a little bit, but do you remember the junior advisory <laughs> committee that we were part of? You were a founding member with me. Um, and basically, you know, there was this women's initiatives network and it was, you know, a lot of senior women, the, the sort of unofficial anecdote was senior women when they made director and needed to do a community contribution, were told like, go join the wind network steering committee and do that for a couple of years. And, you know, it helps you get a leg up for MD. So there were all these women who were kind of in their like mid thirties who, kind of forgot what it was like to be a junior banker and weren't necessarily thinking about the things we were thinking about. And I remember we were just kind of sitting around a lot of the junior women saying like, these emails just don't speak to us. Like they don't, they don't reflect what our priorities are. They don't reflect what we want out of a career at this point. And uh, we basically started this junior advisory committee um, in EMEA. Um, there was also separately a group of women who did the same thing in the Americas in New York. Um, but in EMEA, what we did was we wanted to focus on mentorship and we said, you know, work-life balance is great, but like at this point, we're all kind of single, maybe even living with roommates. Like we just want to dive into our careers and like, you know, make the most of it in the first couple of years. And to do that, we need mentorship and sponsorship. And so we proposed a program and we were basically told we don't have enough senior people who are interested in this program. So we can't match you with a sponsor or a mentor. And we kind of went away and said, okay, let's take that no and turn it into a yes. And we said, okay, we don't want a mentorship matching program. We want a mentorship training program. We're gonna train junior women and men 
on how to make senior bankers care about their career and invest in them. And it was literally what we were just talking about, how to advocate for yourself, how to identify somebody who can help you get where you want to go, who has a skill set they could you know, share with you uh, or train you on, um, who can advocate for you when you want to tr transition to a new role or change teams or try a different office. Um, and having that support network is huge, but I remember like your boss, David was a huge advocate for it. And it, he said it was the first time that he'd gotten involved with the women's network. So it was a great way, I think, of bringing men into the conversation too, and taking that first no and turning it into a yes. It was pretty successful. We got a lot of people involved in that. And it was, it was one of the things that I was most proud of, especially early in my career was building that community together. Yeah. I think it's also a way of like, you really take care and you really care about the people who work with you, even if they're juniors or even if they're interns. It's not just like assigning the value of a person based on our role or title, but really caring about a future or his future and then his or her life. And uh, there are not so many people <laughs> who are like this. So... Yeah, that was amazing, amazing. But do you, did you see any difference between the banking world and the tech world? Uh, because you transitioned in the end to the tech industry from banking. Um, so I know there are a lot of people who would like to do so, so transitioning, but did you see any difference also in terms of like uh, company culture and the way people behave and treat you or more or less is always the same? So... To be honest, I should be careful because I have experience at one investment bank, <laughs> one consulting firm, and one tech company. Um, but I will say, I think what most of the difference seems to be less about industry and more just the evolution over the last, you know, 15 years since I started my career. I think there's more a trend of people, you know, respecting and talking about diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, you know, understanding that sponsorship is critical, understanding that people bringing their whole selves to work is a, you know, huge part of what creates psychological safety and lets people um, not only bring their full selves to work, but bring their best ideas and be comfortable with, you know, conflict and dissent and, and the things that are critical to producing creativity and great ideas and innovation. Um, but I think, as I understand it from, you know, folks who are still in banking and still in consulting, these are things that I think have transcended industries. And, you know, there's a lot of research on this and a lot of kind of social um, emphasis that's been put on this at large in society. So it's hard to say uh, if I'd stayed in banking over the last 15 years, I think I'd probably have seen a lot of similar changes. The biggest change, honestly, is I can wear jeans to work now. And what about, like you mentioned it somehow, but what about a gender dynamics? Do you think uh, we are still far away? I mean, because you mentioned over the past 15 years, something changed and you recognize it. And by the way, I have to say, yes, you passed from one investment banking to one consulting firm to one tech company, but it's like all three three are to one. So you pass from Barclays to McKinsey to Google. So it's just that, um, you know, uh, I, I really want to put the dots where we're in the right place. But um, what do you think in terms of gender equality is also, you know, most of these environments are male dominated as well. Yeah, I mean, I think we were talking about this a little earlier. It's hard to think of too many industries that aren't pretty, if not dominated by men in terms of their representation. representation. They're... There are industries where men set the rules when they were first established. I mean, sometimes I have to think, and again, this isn't industry for specific or sector specific. This is a societal thing. Like in America, women couldn't have their own credit cards till the 70s. Like the fact that I have graduate degrees from like Ivy League schools and, you know, paid my way through grad school and, you know, don't have to worry about a lot of these things and I can be independent and I don't have to like immediately go get married in order to open a bank account. Um, you know, and even can take control of like my, my choice of when and how to have a family, like all of these things are, are, I think, dictating or opening up new uh, possibilities for women in the workforce, no matter what your industry is. Um, 
And on one hand, I think we're very fortunate. On the other hand, I know that this generation is navigating a lot of that for the first time and kind of creating the rules. And um, I will say I was at McKinsey when we, you know, worked with our then managing partner, who is the CEO equivalent uh, at the consulting firm, to say it's crazy that, you know, tech companies are giving people these fertility benefits, you know, to postpone having children uh, and, and give them more optionality about bouncing work and career. And uh, we don't do that yet. And to his credit, he made that possible. Um, so I actually took advantage of that when I was at McKinsey, which is a wonderful right. benefit. And Google offers that too. And I, it was so funny to me because when we made that a benefit, most of the people who were interested in talking to me about it were married women. They weren't women who, you know, I think there's this cliche of, you know, women postponing having kids because they haven't met the right guy. And like, that's certainly... Some people do it for that reason, but I talked to so many married women and married men who wanted their, you know, partners to get this benefit, um, and, and being able to have a little bit of flexibility around how and when you have kids, even for people who got married pretty young. I mean, we're kind of just giving ourselves these tools and figuring out when and how to use them. Um, and I think across the board, the employers that are going to be employers of top talent and retainers of top talent. Are the ones who are going to find the most creative ways to give people the tools they need to balance their lives and their careers um and, and kind of figure that out as they go there's no right answer and we're just we're, we're learning as we go yeah i mean infertility is a big problem and the flexibility to decide where to have a baby it's also something that you know traditional companies do not offer among their benefits, uh, corporate benefits, so usually, you know, even if they cover very good or they provide very good health insurance coverage, but most of the times traditional companies, except for tech companies, they don't provide it. I know because my husband works for a U.S. tech company, so they provide that, but all the rest of traditional companies that don't at all. And yes, and I'm not surprised that a lot of like married women were the first like interested in um find it out more but yeah let's go but back another for example one second to i was gonna say it's another example to me of if you're unhappy and you want to have a kid because you feel pressure time-wise and you're looking for another job because you're in a high high pressure you know finance job or whatever talk to your employer and say, listen, I feel like I'm stuck between a rock and a hard place. And if this was a benefit that was offered, or if there was some sort of support for this, you know, like, I think until men and women advocate for themselves in this way, a lot of employers will just lose talent, and they won't know why. And that's kind of on us to advocate and articulate what it is we need and give people a chance to show up for us. And, or say, no, actually, that's not a priority for us at this time. And then you walk away and you go to the next employer and you have no regrets because you asked for it and you were told no. The worst thing I think yeah. is walking away and not having said what, what it would have been that would have kept you, what would have made you stay and give them a chance to kind of show up and be uh, an employer of choice who wants to support you. And I hear there are a lot of women who would like to have a baby. They were trying naturally, but they are not unfortunately they don't have any success so they start to be so stressed about that and then at the same time they would like to change job but they say you know what if I'm gonna have a baby then how can I like change job then get my new colleagues and my new line manager get to know me but at the same time then as soon as I, after I join the new company then I get pregnant it's not ideal uh, so they're kind of a stuck and it starts just like stressing themselves so much just because, you know, they don't know what to do. It's like they're stuck where they are. Um, yeah, so absolutely. But uh, in this respect, uh, but more broadly, what advice would you give you to your younger self starting out um, in general in the professional world, if I may ask? <laughs> I think, I think really it goes back to treat your first decade of your career your first, your first decade after university, really, uh, as a young adult, as an opportunity to really test what you like and don't like. There were a lot of things I thought I would like that I really didn't like when I tried them. Everything from pe like dating a certain type of person, living in a certain place, um, going back to school, 
um, to different roles in different industries. I actually liked banking a whole lot more than I thought I was going to. I stayed there for four years because I was enjoying it and I was getting responsibility. When I finally decided to leave banking, it was really less motivated by not enjoying banking and more thinking, I have one data point. I like, I like banking, but I don't know compared to what. I have nothing else to compare it to. I'm pretty <laughs> good at banking, but maybe there's something I'm even better at and will be you know, absolutely over the moon passionate about to a degree I can't even fathom because it's the only job I've had. Um, so I know that there's some people who, you know, especially in our parents' generation, right? My parents both worked in finance for their whole careers. And they had slight changes in between different roles. You know, maybe they went from like the commercial lending side to, you know, the, the private investing side. But I think it's exciting that we have this opportunity to jump around different sectors, try a different country, uh, get exposure to working in a different country. Um, you know, I have friends, I haven't done this personally, but I have friends who had the ability to, you know, stop working for a big Fortune 500 company and work for a startup or start their own thing. And when you have to, when you have a little bit more riding on your financial success and security, especially in your 30s, you want to be more optimizing around things that you already know you like and you are good at and you will excel at. In your 20s, I think your job is just to figure out what those things are. So I remember my first job, my first uh, study I did at McKinsey with, with clients was actually in, um, it was in operations. Um, and it was a financial institution. And going in, I thought mm -hmm. I've already covered financial institutions and my least favorite class in business school was operations. And that was the study they gave me. It was the best study I did the whole time I was at McKinsey. Um, you know, so like it, you might have very strong convictions, but until you test them, until you really put them to the test, you don't know what you like and don't like. And you just have very strong opinions. But I think it's important to really test those out. And that takes some risk and that takes some bravery and courage to know that it might not work out at all. Um, I mean, conversely, some of my studies that I fought to get on, you know, tooth and nail at McKinsey, especially like public sector studies, because I was very mission or I am very mission oriented. Um, you know, they had like the worst people or the worst managers or the worst lifestyle, or they were just not inspiring once you got there. And you know, they talked a good game and then you realized, okay, maybe I don't trust this person or maybe I need to sense check things first and do my diligence before I say yes. But it's, you have to have a way of testing these ideas you have in your head because the, that's what the real world is. It's a chance to test what you have, um, th these beliefs that you have about yourself and about what you can offer and about what will make you happy. And you need an open mind. Yes. As you rightly pointed out. Yeah. I mean, your example of your first case at McKinsey is super interesting because in the end you thought, oh my God, I really didn't like this. But then in the end, it turned out to be your best case ever at McKinsey. So yes, you need to have open mind. And most of the times when see women, especially, but in general, people who are very discouraged, but nobody told us that the life was going to be easier. And easy in general. Life is not easy. So it's just good that you know you're going to face challenges because you already know you're going to face challenges. Um, and then challenges will be bumped into your face continually uh, over the course of your years. It's just that you become more prepared, but uh, you have this open mind also to test different things, new things. And you become stronger and then at the same time you become even more resilient. So uh, yeah, I'm, I'm fully with you. Um, I think you said uh, the magic word, resilience. It's, and yes. it only comes <laughs> by having failed and realized that it doesn't end your life. It doesn't end your career. Um, you know, like I, I moved back in with my parents during COVID. I was between uh, apartments, between cities in the back of my mind, I was already thinking about getting a new job. And, you know, I, I just ended up living at home for 18 months in my mid thirties. If you told me at 22, I would move back in with my parents while I was between apartments and between jobs in my mid thirties, I would have thought like the world was ending. And, you know, <laughs> it was a way of getting support. It was what I needed at the time. And I bounced back and was able to buy my own apartment again and get an even better job and just 
create an even better life for myself in a new city. So I think accepting support, taking risks, even if it doesn't look like what you thought your life would look like, the more you do that, the more you realize I am resilient. I will bounce back. I'll bounce back better. Uh, and it's not going to be the end. And that also encourages you in turn to take more risks going forward. So it's it's a virtuous cycle, but you have to kind of trust yourself that you're going to bounce back in the first instance. Uh, yeah, I think it's a story of my life at the same time. So <laughs> I'm like reflecting on myself as well. So yeah, definitely. I love so the word perseverance. So yes, so many, so many. But Kate, um, last one. At Center of Women, we are all about, you know, as you know, empowering women through knowledge and confidence, especially in financial literacy and entrepreneurship. But from your experience, how important do you think is financial literacy and career progression, particularly for women in this case, and tech and finance? And what role do you think platforms like Center of Women can play in supporting women's career and, you know, personal growth in general? It's absolutely critical, not just for women in finance and tech and consulting, but every woman who, you know, wants to control her own destiny, right? And I remember my father, when I was young, used to, you know, he'd give us money to like go out with friends or go to the movies or whatever, but he'd make us ask for it. And he'd make us justify why we were asking for a certain amount of money. And, you know, I'd, he'd say, okay, you're going to the movies you need money? And I'd think, oh yeah, I do. He'd say, how much money do you need? And I'd say, I don't know, $20. And he'd say, okay, well, talk me through it. What will $20 cover? And I'd say, uh, I think like a movie ticket and some snacks. And he'd say, no, like movie ticket actually costs $10 and snacks are going to cost $10 more. And you know, you're going with your friend. Why don't you make sure that you get something you can share? So actually maybe you, you need $25, you know, and just kind of that dynamic of discussing and in a very dispassionate way how much things cost and then having to ask for money and justify it kind of takes a lot of the emotion out of it. I know women who, you know, get to their 20s or even 30s and they're having conversations with, you know, their their bosses advocating for why they should make more money uh, doing the same role as a, a peer or having conversations with a partner or spouse about different spending habits and saving habits and I think the earlier that you can get used to doing this, and this is why now that I have friends who have kids, it's my one tip for them. When I have kids, I will definitely do the same thing with my kids. Just get your kids talking about money in a very like not guilt way, not a not guilt ridden way, a very not um, uh, natural, intense, stressful way. Yeah, it's just it's it's like what did you have for breakfast, and like how much money do you need for lunch? It's it shouldn't be a big scary thing. Um, and the other thing I would say, so, it, you know, if you didn't grow up with parents who kind of coached you on this and made you feel like it was natural, one of the best things I can recommend to people to do, um, definitely in the U.S. where this is kind of part of our political culture, but even, you know, in Europe doing it for, for charity or for um, an organization you care about is raise funds, um, ask people for donations. A lot of the research shows that women are much more comfortable advocating when it's not just for them. So when they can think about, I'm advocating for this museum that's doing this tremendous uh, fundraising campaign to build a new wing or buy a new you know, set of artwork that they can make available to the public and there's some sort of cultural or social significance. Or if you're at work and you're advocating for your team to get me more resourcing, a lot of women find it easier to do that and to, um, they're, they're better at it when they know who they're fighting for. So I think it's, it's a good way to get If you're not comfortable advocating for yourself, get comfortable advocating for other people around you. And again, asking for money on behalf of a good cause, whether it's your team at work or or a you know organization, social organization, charitable organization you care about, is a great way to just get comfortable. Because at the end of the day, if you can't talk about money, everything else kind of doesn't matter. All the skills about how what percentage you save and where you put it, like you just need to be comfortable and confident around money, and the rest you can all learn especially for sensible women. Absolutely. And then, like, for example, I mean, before we conclude, uh, what I'm trying to do with my kids is, like, with the uh, oldest, uh, giving her every Sunday three years made up of one coin each, uh, one year each, 
and then she's got three piggy banks and one she marks uh, saving the other one is fun and the third one is like donating right. and so she had to use to this so that you know she puts one year each into these three piggy banks um and then at least she knows okay i want to have fun because i want to buy a unicorn in this case she really loves unicorns i don't know why um but of course she has to ask permission to mommy and daddy and then she can take the money from the fun uh piggy bank but then for the rest like saving and then of course we invest those money but at least she knows the money has worth something that are not evil and then it's super natural to speak about it and then learn uh, you know, she's almost six years old, how to manage them. So it's a supernatural process. So I'm fully with you. Um, so Kate, I don't want to take too much of your time, uh, but, uh, you know, this brings us to the end of our chat. Um, super thank you for being here with us and because I think your story is not just inspiring, but uh, it's a real guide for many of us, especially for women and you know, who wants to make their mark in the corporate world at the same time. So thank you so much, um, you know, for sharing your journey and uh, insights. Well, thank you for having me. I'm thrilled to be here and always thrilled to catch up with you because like I said, you are such a big part of, you know, how I started <laughs> in my career and, and, you know, we're one of my earliest supporters and confidants. So thank you. Thank you so much. And then to everyone listening, uh, thank you tuning in to Sensational Chats. And remember, every step forward, no matter how small, is a step towards your own success story. So don't forget to subscribe to more inspiring stories and useful advice. And then see you next time and keep chasing your dreams. Thank you so much.